right, everybody. Like uh, Owen said, my name's Simon. I'm going to be going through ad some advanced Linux for you. For those of you who weren't here for my research presentation last week, this is a little overview about myself. I'm um, a member of the ISTS Black team this year. I'm in charge of Linux. I'm on our red team. I'm on CCDC this year as well. I'm um, interested in web applications, application security in general, and also just exploit development once you find a vulnerability. And my hobbies are playing paintball and then just general video games. All right, let's get right into this. Just a quick little overview. We're going to talk about some general scripting madness, just a little bit about how you can use Bash to do some cool and interesting things. We're going to talk about some file system shenanigans. We're also going to talk about the processes, specifically the way the process file system works and how that gets mapped and everything. We're going to talk about some raw sockets again. And as you all know from last week, those are my favorite. We're also going to talk about a really useful command called LSOF. Um, and then we'll just cover some more file permissions, some SE Linux stuff, and then also um, kernels. So let's talk about the Linux file system. So many of you have heard, actually, how many of you have heard uh, that everything in Linux is a file? Raise your hand if you've heard that term. Cool, perfect. All right, so that's kind of true. There's like an asterisk next to that where like some things are represented as a file, but they're not actually a file. Okay, so we'll kind of talk about what that actually is like in a little bit. But most everything in Linux can be represented as a file in one way or another. And that's kind of where the, that term file descriptor comes in. If any of you guys have ever done any programming with sockets or any files of that type, you usually get returned a file descriptor, right? And then you use that file descriptor later on in your program to reference that specific like input-output chain, that stream for that file, right? So because of this, and because most things can be represented as a file with these file descriptors, we can do some fun and interesting things. If you look right here, you can see echo high into slash proc slash PID FD0. Uh, we'll talk about that on the next slide. Um, but you can do things like that where you're actually echoing a string into a process. Okay. So this wonderful thing of everything being represented as a file sounds great and all, but whenever you can do things like literally just echoing strings into processes, you can kind of see where malicious intent and malicious uh, actions start to come into play here. So let's take a look at slash proc real quick. So slash proc, if you just ls slash, which is just lsing the root of your file system, you'll see a whole bunch of stuff. And in there, slash proc is going to be one of them. Okay. So this folder is going to contain all the process IDs okay, of any running process on your system. So whenever you ls slash proc, if you want to do that right now, if you have a terminal, you'll just see a whole bunch of numbers. And if you ls dash l, you'll see on the side that it'll be labeled as a directory. Okay. Now this is one of the places where it's not really a file. What happens here is this directory is a mapping of kernel memory into something the file system can understand. Okay, so that's why whenever we look inside this slash proc folder, it looks like all these processes are just files, but that's just because the kernel has mapped them all into something that our file system can understand. Okay, so like on the last slide, we look right here at that echo command. This means we can do some pretty cool things. Okay, so right here, does anybody have an idea of what that echo command is doing? Anybody want to want to venture a guess? No. Bader, you got your hand. What's up? It does what? I'm sorry? Right. OK. Yeah. So Bader's absolutely right. So we echo high, and then the double caret is for an append. And then we are putting that into proc, sum PID, FD, and 0. OK? So remember how I talked about file descriptors? Um, in every PID folder, you can look under this notable files thing right here. In every PID, the third bullet is an FD folder. Okay? FD is going to stand for file descriptor. That's the common term, the common nomenclature that you'll see in code over and over again. Anytime something returns a file descriptor, you'll see FD used. Okay? So in that directory, it contains more representations of the file streams. Okay? Does anybody know the three most common ones? that you use all the time and what their values are. Yeah, Ian. Right, so Ian's answer was standard in, standard out, and standard error. Okay? 
So if we go back and look at this command, this echo command again, does anybody know what file descriptor zero is? Standard, are you sure it's standard in? Right, it's standard out. So now that we know we're echoing a string into the process, file descriptor zero, which is standard out, what do you think this is doing? What do you think this command is doing? Right. This command is echoing the string high to the standard output of whatever process that is. Okay? So think for a second, if you're in a red team competition, okay, and red team's on your box, you're the blue teamer, and red team gets the process ID of your bash shell, your bash session, right? The red teamer can just echo garbage into your standard output. Okay? Just think about that. That would look really, really weird, and you'd probably have no idea what's happening. But that's some of the control that this representation of mapping the process structure onto the file system allows you to do. So just hash over the notable files really quick. Um, in PROC, any process, the exe is a symbolic link to the binary. So if you want to go into a VM or something and you check the process and you actually look at that executable and run file on that, on that uh, it'll actually say symbolic link to you know, whatever executable. So I did this on ZSH. It'll say symbolic link to ZSH. Okay, so it just gives you what it is. And then CMD line on the bottom there are the arguments passed to the process. And then environ is all the environment variables also associated with that process. <clears throat> all right. So now that we know what proc FS is, which is the process file system, um, we can manipulate it a little bit. Okay, so we know that it stores a lot of information about the uh, process and all the information. Okay. So what would happen if we like mounted a process, right? Because we can use the mount command to mount files and folders and drives to other locations, right? What would happen if we mounted a process to slash temp, right? What this will actually do is hide that process from commands like ps, okay? Now, you'll still be able to see the mount point of this, okay? So it's not completely hidden. But it's no longer seen by a command like ps, which goes through all the process trees, OK? Because it's technically no longer found in the normal location anymore. Also, we can overwrite um, argv0, which for those who haven't done a lot of C programming, argv0, whenever you type in a command, that's actually the command that you've typed in. OK, so whenever you run the command ls, like dash a, ls would be the first argument, so arg0. And then dash a would be argument one, OK? Because it's an array. We're zero indexed. It's a little confusing, but you'll get there. So we can actually overwrite stuff like that and actually mess with uh, things like the exe. So the exe file right here, we can actually mess with that value, that symbolic link, or just execute new processes. And then in ps, it'll show up as a different process, OK? So let's do, this is just a little demo. Oh, where's my mouse at? There it is. OK. So this is just kind of going to show what that mount thing is like. So we're going to sleep 120 and background it. PS, so you can see the sleep still running right here on the second to bottom line. And then we're going to mount it to slash temp. So we're going to mount slash proc and then the PID, which is right here, to temp. With, and the dash B flag is for bind. So now we run PS and we can see it's no longer there. It's no longer found in P by PS anymore. So that process is now hidden. Okay? But again, you'll still be able to see the mount point, so it's not completely hidden. But that's just a cool, dirty little trick you can do to you know, sneak a process away. Cool. Is this going to let me? Hang on. Let me get back to my, my screen somehow. There we go. OK. So. After talking about all the processes, let's go to one of my favorite topics and something that's near and dear to my heart, raw sockets. Um, so if you weren't here last week for research, I actually gave a whole presentation focused on just this topic, what they are, how to find them, and everything. So I'm going to kind of go through this kind of quicker. And if you're more interested in this topic, either come and ask me questions or go and watch my talk on that. Anyway, raw sockets um, are basically a raw socket, right? And so that's a socket with all the good bits stripped off of it, OK? A socket, think of it as like a nice polished thing that you can use and everything. And if you rip the polish off of something, it usually becomes a little more rougher, right? So a raw socket, you don't get any 
filtering, okay? It just goes straight from the, from the NIC back up to your application, okay? It's not processed by any of the net filter stuff. And you have to do all the building of the packets, the processing of the packets, accepting the data, parsing the data. You have to do everything yourself, okay? Now, if you've ever wondered how tools like TCP dump or Wireshark are actually able to see all of that information coming, you know, you can enter into promiscuous mode and you can just see everything, right? That's because they, specifically TCP dump uses what's called a raw socket to do that, okay? And also, if you want to test this, you can block all traffic through IP tables and you'll still be able to see traffic through TCP dump, okay? And that's because IP tables and everything is going to sit at layer three, right? If we think about the networking layers and everything, whenever the packets come in for processing, raw sockets, you know, they sidestep all of that and they're not processed the same way as normal packets are. So that's how you can use them to get around firewall rules. So right here, this link is to the RIT Red Team's GitHub page, specifically to a tool called Watershell, which is an implementation of raw sockets in C++, I believe. Right, it was ported over to C++. Yeah, Watershell is the name of it. Um, but a good exercise if you want to test finding these things and seeing how they work is you can install Watershell and then you can play around. Um, I recommend blocking all your firewalls, like literally block all traffic, and then Watershell will still be able to communicate between its server and your box because, again, raw sockets kind of bypass all that filtering. Um, Again, if you want to learn more about this, uh, go watch the talk I gave last week. Um, LSOF is an awesome, awesome, awesome command. Okay? This stands for list open files. All right? So it's super powerful because you can actually pass things like a process ID to it, and then it will show you all of the open files that that process has open. Okay? It'll show all of the files that that process is like using. Okay? So if you have like some sort of process that you think might be malicious or something else and you don't really know what's going on, you can run this command on its process ID. And if it's like got your SSH config open for some reason, you know, that's probably bad. You don't want that to happen, right? You should probably look into it a little more. Excuse me. Now, going back to the whole idea that everything can be represented as a file, kind of, right? This also means we can use LSOF to get network information. Okay, because with files, we get that file descriptor. File descriptors are also used for sockets, right? Because it's just a way for you as the programmer to access a certain input output stream, and that's what network sockets are, right? They're just input output streams. So you can use LSOF here, dash I, and that'll actually give you all of like the networking information, similar to how netstat or sockstat will give it to you as well, okay? And then here, if you specify the 4 right there on that LSOF-I4, that'll give you all the IPv4 specific information. Okay? And then if you put a 6 there, it would give you all the IPv6 information. Okay? So you can also track network information with that command right there. It's just going to check for TCP and sockets. Um, again, this is a super, super powerful command because we can represent everything as a file. Okay? All right, so this is just going to be a quick demo of what LSOF is. And I also went over how to use LSOF to do exactly what this demo is going to show you uh, in my talk, which is find raw sockets, how to find them. So right now on this machine, that tool Watershell is installed and running. Okay, So we, you can't see this, but he ran netstat-tulpin, which is the go-to flag arrangement for netstat. And you can see there's only one TCP connection. Okay, Watershell doesn't show up anywhere. But now we're running LSOF pipe grep uh, dash E for capital E for regex, little i for, uh, I believe, um, uppercase and lowercase don't matter. And then we grep for TCP uh, pipe raw, which a pipe in regex stands for or. So we're looking for TCP or raw sockets. And then at the end there, let's just uh, skip forward a little bit. At the end there at the bottom right here, this very bottom one, you can't see all that well. But this is actually water shell showing up now. Okay. <clears throat> so LSLF is super, super powerful because you know, we ran netstat or sockstat, and that didn't show us the connection, right? It didn't show us that. And also in my talk, I mentioned um, there's a flag that you can use for sockstat, which is a W, and that, according to the man page, supposedly shows you raw socket connections. It doesn't. It doesn't work. Yes? Where can we go to find the docs? 
the RIT Sec YouTube page. The, the question was, where can you find to go? Where can you go to find my talk? If you missed it, go to the RIT Sec YouTube page. Thank you, John. Um, all right, we're going to move on. I lost my train of thought. <laughs> no, you're good. All right, that's OK. So let's talk about some file permissioning now. <clears throat> so file permissions in Linux are, they can seem kind of confusing at first. right? How many of you have ever said, let's just chmod 777 this and just call it a day. It's going to work. <laughs> right? How many of you guys have heard that? How many of you have done it? <laughs> yeah, those are. Y'all are my people, right? Right? Something's not working because of a permission error. You just chmod 777 and you just call it a day. All right? So let's talk about what that actually means, though. So chmod is the command chmod. Okay? It stands for change. I actually don't know what it stands for. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> but basically, it just changes file permissions. Okay? And it changes stuff about the file. All right? So the. File permissions are going to show up as an R for read, a write for, or a W for write, and an X for execute. Okay, and you can see that up there in the picture. <clears throat> so if you want to actually look at this and follow along at home, you can type ls-l, and then it'll show you all of this stuff. Um, okay, so the values 777 actually come from these, the R, W, and X matching up to their binary values. Okay. So just look at a triplet of them, all right? So don't look at all of them. Just look at a triplet. So just R, W, and X, OK? So the first one, X, is going to be a 1, because it's in the first like binary location, right? And then the W is going to be a 2, because it's in the second one. And then the R will be a 4, OK? So then you get the chmod 777 from you know, adding up the combination of them. So 7 would be 4 for read. 2 for write, and then 1 for x being added together for 7. OK? Is everybody with me so far? I know we're CSEC and not math, but I hope we can all add. <laughs> OK. So now you may be wondering why there's three, three groups of triplets, right? That picture does a good job of showing it, but the three numbers, the first one is associated with the owner of the file. OK? So if you look at a file, it might say, you know, root as the first name, colon, and then root again. Okay, so the first name is the owner, and then after the colon is the group that owns it. Okay, or has access to it. <coughs> Excuse me. So the first one is for the owner, the owner's permissions. The second triplet is for the group's permissions, and then the last triplet is for anyone else that doesn't fall under those two categories. Okay. So another really common permissioning scheme you might hear about is 755, which is the owner can do everything and then the group, and then others can read and execute. Okay, That's another common one. 655 is another common one. And then I believe for like uh, your SSH keys and stuff, 400 is the common one. Um, and then like owned by root, because you just want um, you know, root to be able to read it, or your user to be able to read it. And then you don't want anyone else to be able to modify your SSH keys, right? because that would be bad. Um, but those are just some common ones. <coughs> now. In this, if we look at that picture right there, uh, can, you, can everybody read that OK? Can we all read that OK? <coughs> I'm just going to take that as a yes. Cool. So first, we got the user Halto. We're going to transition from Simon land, and we're going to embody Jack for a second. All right? For those of you who don't know, that's Jack McKenna's handle is Halto. All right? So first, he's going to run ls-a, and he's showing us that a.out binary. Okay? And we can see the permissions and everything. Right here, this is what I was talking about. The first name here is the owner, and the second name is the group. Okay, So Holto Holto, awesome. So he's obviously got all the permissions to it. So we run it. And this, all this binary does is it's going to cat or echo out whoever you are, like which user you're, you're running this as, basically. right? It's basically running, who am I? <coughs> so then after we run it and we see that we're Holto, we're going to chone it, which is change owner. Right? So we're going to make root the owner as both the user and the group. And then we're going to apply that to a.out. And then we see this second command here, which is chmod u plus s a.out. We don't know what that is, so we're just going to ignore it. Whatever. Cool. Just stay with me. I, some of you may be questioning me, but just go with it. Um, <laughs> so then we're going to check the permissions again. You can see it's now owned by root. But if you look really close, we see an s where the x should be. Okay, for the owner. 
All right, we'll get to that in a second. But now we run the binary again, and instead of halto, we're root now. What the heck? What happened? So this is actually another thing that you need to watch out for. And this is what's called the set UID bit, or SUID bit. And so what this bit can do, and it's set with, by that chmod u plus s command right there, what that bit does is you can run a binary with the permissions of the owner as an underprivileged user. OK? So let's look. this is a perfect example. We run the binary first. It tells us we're running it as Holto. OK? <clears throat> we set the owner as root, and then the SUID bit. We run it again. We're still running the binary from Holto's session, right? The underprivileged user. But now the binary is executing as root. OK? Because that binary is now executing with the owner's privileges. OK? Does that make sense? Yeah? So. There's another bit, which is the GUID bit, which is a very similar thing, not as common. I don't think I've ever seen it in the wild before. But you can do it. It's the same thing as the set UID. Um, <clears throat> however, this gives you group permissions. So it does the same thing, but it runs it under the privileges of the group owner. OK? So SUID sounds really cool and all, right? Who can give me some examples of, like, good uses of an SUID bit on a binary. Owen. Well, pre like legitimate uses. We'll get there. Yeah. Yeah. All right, give me something other than sudo. Uh, Bader. Yeah. So Bader gave me the binary password, right? Passwd. OK? And for those of you who don't know, you use that to change your password on a Linux system. OK? Let's think about that. Whenever you change your password in a Linux system, you have to change your password, and that's going to like, make the new hash in the shadow file, right? The only person who can read the shadow file is root, OK? But if you're you know, John Doe, and you're logged into a box, and you want to change your password to like Hunter 3 because you got popped, <laughs> you know, how are you going to change that password if you don't have root privileges? Yes, Robert. Oh, ha, 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 ha. Yeah, Robert's memeing on me because when you type a password in, it's a row of asterisks. But joke's on you. Nothing shows up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, back to the password. So password has a, is a legitimate practical use to having this SUID bit set. It's owned by root, and it has this bit set because anyone needs to change their password, right? But you need root privileges, but you don't want to give them access to sudo because that would just be poor practice, right? So that's a legitimate use. Owen, what's a bad use of SUID? Privilege escalation. Privilege escalation. Excellent. So how many of you guys use the find command in Linux? Yeah? A lot of people, right? <laughs> so how many of you know that you can use find to actually privilege escalate yourself from a low privilege user to root? You can use the find command to do that, OK? Now, you can only do that if the SUID bit on the find binary is set and it's owned by root. Okay? If it's owned by another high privilege user, you can use it to escalate to them too. Doesn't, it, root doesn't matter, okay? any, any higher privilege user. Okay? And that's because find allows you to run, it has an exec flag. And then with that flag, you can exec bin bash. And since find is running as that user, it spawns a new bash process as that user it's owned by. Okay? So this is a really common way in CTFs and stuff for privilege escalation is the set UID bit. Um, so we've talked about binaries now. What if I want to write a bash script and set UID it because I only know bash. I don't want to waste my time with C and compile things because compilations always break. Can, do you think you can set the SUID bit on a bash script? Yes or no? How many say yes? How many say no? Oh, all right, the few people who said no are correct, OK? You cannot, I repeat, you cannot set the SUID bit on a script, OK? I spent many hours trying to do this, OK? Believe me, you can't do it. This is because, <clears throat> think about it, whenever you run a bash script, what happens? What actually runs that script? The bash interpreter, right? That script gets run under bash, OK? So, Set UIDing the script doesn't really make sense because the entire interpreter would need the SUID bit set, right? And this goes for Python as well. 
OK? Except if you try to set the SUID bit on a bat, on like on bash, Linux gets upset. OK? I don't even think you can do it. It might just not let you. But I do know it'll break a lot of things and make things very, very unhappy. All right? But it's also a good thing to check if Python has the SUID bit set, because that means any Python script you run under Python, you know, will execute with those user privileges. So SUID is it's so much fun. Highly recommend diving into it more. All right, let's, let's move on a little bit. File attributes. OK, so we talked about file permissions and everything, but now we have attributes, OK? And the two that we're going to talk about here are the immutable bit and the append bit, OK? So uh, you can edit or change the attributes of a file to be immutable, which means you can't change the contents, you can't override it, you, can't, you, can, you basically can't touch it, you can't do anything. And that's in the upper right-hand corner is him setting the immutable bit, OK? Now, you do this with the chatter command. <coughs> it's perfect because we're in winter, so we're all probably chattering anyway. Um, yeah, that was really bad. Only one person left. <laughs> anyway, so you use the chatter command and plus I or minus I to add or take away, and similarly, plus A or minus A to append. <coughs> and append is exactly what it sounds like. You can only append to a file, you can't overwrite. Okay? So, what would be a good use for the append flag? Where, where might you add or chatter append files? What would, be a, what would be a pretty good place to do that? Yeah? Bash RC. Bash RC. Yeah, you could do that. That would be good. Um, it wouldn't stop Red Team from like, adding things, though. But yeah, it's, it's absolutely. If you have like, ex environment variables you don't want to get nuked, yeah, absolutely. Who, what's a better one? I'm thinking of one. One really good place to chatter. What's up? Logs. Logs. Jim's not here, but if he was here, he would really appreciate it. He's our logging boy. But our logs, right? In var slash var slash log, that's where all of our service information is going, right? If Apache's broken, where are you going to check? Your logs. If Red Team's logging in, you're going to check your audit logs, right? You got you to gotta keep your logs, OK? Now, a mean Red Team will nuke your logs. RIT Red Team, we don't touch your logs. That's OK. Um, so yeah, just chattering plus A, all your log files, perfect, because then you keep them all. You can see everything. <clears throat> all right, so let's move on. We're going to start getting down a little bit. We're going deeper in the system now. Oh yeah, that's good stuff. OK, <clears throat> now we're going to talk about namespaces. All right, and full disclaimer, I learned about namespaces roughly an hour ago. All right, <laughs> I came across this slide. And I'm like, the only namespace I know of is whenever C++ code gets dropped in front of me, and I still don't know what's going on. All right. But namespaces are actually pretty simple, I found. Okay? So think about Docker. All right? Think about Chroot. If you, if you don't know what Chroot is, you can just change the root. It literally stands for change root of like a process or something. So instead of referencing slash as the root, you can like have it reference you know, slash home, slash John Doe, whatever, as its root now. That's all it does. So it's basically, think about segmentation of processes and also networks, and then we'll talk about C groups too, OK? So the mount namespace, OK? You can make a different mount namespace, which will act like Chroot. It's very similar. <coughs> However, creating a mount namespace allows processes to see a completely different root than the rest of the file system, OK? So you can, like, that's kind of what we were doing with, um, whenever we mounted a process right earlier, whenever we mounted that process to temp, it's kind of like what was going on there. It kind of moved it off to the side from the, what's normal, right? So <clears throat> this allows you to have different root mount points for different processes, OK? So just keep thinking segmentation with all of these things. So next, we have our process ID namespace. So if you don't know, whenever you start a Linux machine, the very first thing to run is the init process, OK? And that gets a PID of numero uno, OK? It's the very first thing to run, and it spawns everything else, all right? So you can actually create a new namespace for a process, and that will make it process ID one, OK? So you have your whole process ID tree, and you can make a whole new one for a process, and whenever one you started will become one. OK? But this is different from your system process tree. Keep that in mind. It just segments everything. OK? So now this process is in this namespace. OK? 
We also have network namespaces, which is very similar to everything else. It creates a different network stack, basically, for the processes to see and everything. So think about Docker. For those of you who haven't used Docker, whenever you go into Docker land, Docker has its own networking shenanigans it does, and you'll learn to have a love-hate relationship with it a lot, um, speaking from experience. But, uh, <laughs> but think about it. It, for those of you who have used Docker, right, you can reference other containers by name. Right? So if you have a container named web server and you have a container named DB and the web server needs to con connect to the database, you can literally reference the database from the web server by saying DB. Okay? But then from your host laptop, if you say ping DB, your laptop's going to be like, you're crazy, stop. I don't know what that is, right? unless you have a host entry for it. Um, but it's just not going to know. And that's because it has a separate network namespace. Right? Now, C groups, all C groups are, this is an awful, awful name for it, but think about namespaces for resources. Okay? So things like how much RAM your process can have, CPU, all, any resource okay, is a C group namespace. Okay? That's all that is. So it's literally saying, you, John, as a process, you get one meg of RAM and no CPU time. Like, that's what it is. Okay? <sighs> All right, so we're going to go even deeper now, and we'll talk about the Linux kernel a little bit. So the kernel literally sits between user land, which is where it's all happy, hunky-dory, you know, unicorns, butterflies, and stuff. And then it sits between you and the hardware. Okay, Hardware, dark, scary place. User land, bright, happy place. Kernel, eh, that's, about, that's, eh, that's about how I feel about it. Um, <laughs> But the kernel basically does all the hard work for you, OK? Going back to the socket versus raw socket example, where sockets do all the nice, pretty things for you, and then a raw socket, you have to do all the hard work. That's kind of like what happens with user land and kernel, OK? So the kernel does all the mapping of memory. It handles the scheduling. It handles syscalls. If any time you call like read or write for like user input or anything, <clears throat> it's, you've got to go through the kernel for it, OK? And if you ever hear the term ring zero, Referencing that up there, ring zero is the kernel, okay? And then the core is just hardware. It's scary, bad, don't like it. Um, but that's, that's kind of an overview of what the kernel does. So let's look at actually how user mode and kernel interact. So you as the programmer, you want to you know, get user input. You actually want to have a decent looking program. So you don't want to just hard code everything, because that would be a lot of if checks. Yeah. My roommate, uh, freshman year, actually, he had to write a program that checked like how many odd numbers out of five were entered or something. And this madman, this mad lad, wrote every possible condition in a giant if block. Like every possible case that could have been entered was an if check. His code was 600 lines long. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. All right, back to the presentation. Uh, so user mode. User programmer want to write something or get user input. Okay? An interrupt is going to happen whenever you call that reader output function. Okay? And then an interrupt handler is going to be like, oh, that's got to go to the kernel. And then the kernel is going to look in a syscall table <coughs> for the syscall. So in this case, if it's read, it's going to look in the syscall table for read. And then it's going to you know, do the kernel and shenanigans, actually get that stuff, because you're going to have to interface with the hardware right, to get the typey typey letters. You're going to have to interface with hardware to get that. So the kernel is going to handle all that for you, and then yeet that string back up to the program, and boom, you just read in user input. But the kernel handles it for you. right? We're all hunky-dory, easy peasy. And that's basically, basically what happens uh, really, really, really fast. Okay. Oh boy, we're going we're gonna to need some of this. This is for my boy, Zach Jorgensen. <laughs> for those of you that don't know him, this man loves SE Linux. Oh my goodness, I've never seen someone get so excited about something you should turn off when you log into a box. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to do my best to tell you guys what it is. So SE Linux is an access control mechanism, OK? So whenever you guys take the authentication class, you'll talk about this more, all right? So SE Linux is a mandatory access control, OK? So there's two types. There's mandatory access control, which is called MAC, and then there's discretionary access control, which is DAC, OK? Mandatory access control, your sysadmin or owner or whoever 
is going to make a whole bunch of access levels, okay? And then they're going to associate users with said access levels, okay? So think, keep that in your head. DAC, discretionary access control, is going through every file on your file system and saying, these three people can access this file. These six can access this one. Da, 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 da. Okay? DAC is very similar to what Linux implements. In fact, the Linux file system permission is a DAC system, I believe. Okay? So <clears throat> you can see very quickly for an organization or company, DAC doesn't scale. Okay? What if you have a big like department firing, like you just don't want you know, the DevOps team anymore or something like that, and you hire more security people? Woo! Um, <laughs> I love DevOps people. I'm sorry. You're, you're welcome too. Um, but, you know, what if you lose a lot of user accounts and stuff? Now you have to go back through all the files and remove their access, right? With SE Linux, it scales a lot better because you just put users and access levels and then associate files with those levels, okay? It's a lot better. It scales a lot more and you have a lot more fine-grained control, but it just takes longer. Uh, it might take a little bit more, um, you know, administration and stuff, but in my opinion, it's far better than DAC. Okay, so I'm not even gonna try to pretend like I know what is going on in this picture, except that these are what are known as SE Linux contexts, okay? So if we look right here at the top one, <clears throat> we're checking the SE Linux contests on my dir and my file, which are all the way on the far right, okay? And the owner is Eli Eli, right? And then you get unconfined you, object R, user home, blah, 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 SE Linux garbage, right? Um, and then we check Etsy password. And if you notice the SE Linux contexts, the weird strings you've never seen before in your life, are different, right? And then if you look at the very bottom where we actually run the ID command and it'll give you your SE Linux context, you can see that Eli's context matches uh, like bash, ps, and my dir and my file. Right? But it doesn't match Etsy password. Okay? So this is because, so Eli in this situation cannot read Etsy password. Normally all users can read Etsy password, right? You can all cat Etsy password. With Etsy Linux, you can set it up where Etsy password is in a higher security level than the majority of your users. So even though normally you can, with Etsy Linux, you can't read it. Okay? You can't access it. Does that make sense? Um, Real quick, anytime I hear the word SE Linux, my mind just goes set and force zero. Okay? Set and force zero is the way you turn this off. Okay? At Red Hat Systems. Just turn it off. <laughs> uh, also, real quick, contrary to popular belief, SE Linux does not stop SQL injection. Are there any questions? <laughs> yeah, all my people know that one. Yep. <laughs> Anybody got any questions? Anything? Anything I went too fast over? Anything you want me to clarify or go back over? No? Awesome. Thanks, guys. You're a great audience. Thank you.